Hi everybody, and thank you for having me here today. I've been a fan of this workshop for a while, so I was really delighted to receive Oz's very kind invitation to be a keynote speaker. And as I have the honor of going first today, I thought I'd start us off with a little bit of history. So in the mid-1960s, French cartographer Jacques Bertin wrote his epic tome, The Semiology of Graphics. And in it, he proposed that images are perceived as a set of signs with a sender encoding information that the reader decodes using their visual perceptual system. And the reader in particular is trying to identify salient elements of the image and the relationships between them. As an example, Bertin sketched out three points, A, B, and C, and noted that there were three properties you could decode about them. A nominal property to say that A, B, and C are distinguishable, an ordinal property to say that B is between A and C, and finally a quantitative property to say that B, C is twice as long as A, B. And to encode this type of information, Bertin proposed a design space consisting of graphical primitives or shapes that he called marks, and encoding data along their properties or visual variables such as position, color, or size. Now hopefully this should all sound very familiar to us because Bertin's semiology is widely considered to provide us the theoretical foundation for modern data visualization, inspiring work like Cleveland and McGill's graphical perception studies, Jock McKinley's expressiveness and effectiveness criteria, and all the toolkit work spawned by systems like Tableau and Lee Wilkinson's grammar of graphics. Now, this timeline that I've sketched out is the most common lineage people trace for data visualization, but it often misses one key piece of work, which is the second shorter book that Bertin wrote, La Graphique, about a decade or so after the semiology. And in English, the title is translated to Graphics and Graphic Information Processing, and Bertin opens with the story about a hotel manager who is really anxious about improving his establishment's performance. And so he tasked his staff with compiling various statistics and his staff returned to him with this table. Unfortunately, this table just sort of sat on his desk and collected a lot of dust because it didn't immediately surface any interesting insight about what to do. Um, but then one day the manager's assistant presented him with a graphic visually grouping the data in ways that made the trends more salient. Now what interests me about this example is not the classic story about the power of visualization, but rather the process the assistant took to creating this graphic. Now starting with the original table, the first thing the assistant did was adopt a visual language. They encoded the statistics as a bar chart, uh, but then the bars were shaded for months where the, the value of that month exceeded the annual average. And they repeated the bars um, to duplicate the year so that they, they wouldn't miss any seasonal trends over the winter. But the assistant didn't stop there. In addition to adopting a visual language, they also started to use a processing language by splitting up the rows of the table and recording each row on a separate sheet of paper. And by doing so, the assistant could rearrange these sheets over and over again until they were able to identify salient trends in the data. And so this process of repeatedly shuffling rows back and forth, they noticed three types of trends emerge, and they labeled them here three, four, and five. The first set, label three, were metrics that seemed to vary on a semi-annual basis, and in four were metrics that seemed to vary on a quarterly basis. And in this group of metrics down below, they also noticed um, sort of four highly differentiated periods throughout the year. And by bringing back some of the labeling from earlier, the assistant was able to really distill some of these higher level groupings and trends. For example, they were able to characterize these active and slow periods based on the presence or absence of conventions and thus the sort of knock-on effect on business people and travel agencies and so forth. And they were also able to notice sort of marked differences between the summer and winter months. So in the winter, for example, the hotel experienced more local guests with a higher percentage of women, greater differences in ages, whereas in the summer there were more foreign guests and a much more homogeneous age group. And in fact, Bertin found this sort of interactive analysis so compelling that the archives of his lab are sort of replete with examples of these paper matrices that were handcrafted with paper and glue and scissors. And in the book, Bertin remarked that sort of a graphic is not drawn once and for all, it is constructed and reconstructed until it reveals all the relationships constituted by the interplay of the data, and that the best graphic operations are those carried out by the decision makers themselves. And indeed, the importance of interactivity in visualization or data analysis is no longer a surprise to us, 
because as Thomas and Cook say, it supports a dialogue between the analyst and the data. And as Pike et al. have identified, it's through this sort of analytic discourse that knowledge is constructed and tested and refined and shared. And indeed, the research literature is full of examples of interactive visual analysis systems and techniques, and they tend to span that typical expressiveness ease of use spectrum. Right, so on one end, we've got systems like Tableau that have a fixed palette of general purpose techniques, things like selecting points of interest, filtering them, brushing and linking. But if I wanted to add some kind of custom interactivity, that would be pretty much impossible. A few steps along the spectrum, we've got systems like Upset from researchers at the University of Utah and Harvard that implement custom techniques, in this case, um, a variety of set-based manipulations. However, again, users are limited to just the interaction techniques that the system supports and can't add any custom ones that might be more pertaining to the tasks that they care about. And so on the other hand, uh, and the other end of these spectrums, for really custom techniques, users have been forced to do a lot of low-level programming like in D3 that I'm showing here. And for those of us who've tried to do this, we are undoubtedly familiar with sort of how tedious and error-prone this all is. Um, and in the case of analysts and designers, this sort of low-level programming is often very orthogonal to the, the analysis and design considerations they have. And so it might not necessarily occur as frequently or often as analysts might prefer as part of their typical workflow. And so there's really this sort of gap between these two poles, a kind of equivalent high-level abstraction, equivalent to what Bertin formulated with marks and visual variables, but this time for interaction techniques. And so this is a gap that I've been working to address with a number of my colleagues, including Kanit Wong Sepasawat, Dominic Moritz, and Jeff Hare, with this visualization toolkit called Vega Light. And so here is what a visualization specification looks like in Vega Light. Um, as you can see, it's sort of heavily inspired by Bertin and Wilkinson's grammar of graphics. We define where a data set comes from. In this case, we'll be using data from the Gapminder Foundation. Um, this is data about sort of global health um, statistics and indicators. We specify a particular mark that we want to use, in this case, circle marks. And then our visualization comprises of mappings between visual variables like X, Y, color, and size, and data fields like fertility and life expectancy and so forth. And here, the type annotations indicate the data type of these fields. So Q indicates quantitative data, N for nominal, and so forth. And if JSON isn't your cup of tea, members of our community have also developed bindings to generate this JSON in either a more Pythonic syntax um, using the Altair library, or something more at home in R with the Vegalite package that you could find on CRAN. But for this talk, I'm going to stick with the canonical JSON format. And so this short spec that we see actually produces this scatter plot. And the reason I'm able to be so concise in my specification is because I've omitted a lot of low level details, like what the scales are I'm using or the definition for the axes and legends that you see on screen. And that's because the Vega Light compiler automatically inf infers sensible defaults based on the specific visual encodings that I've used, as well as the data types of the fields that are being encoded. I, of course, could go in and override any of those defaults if I so chose. Now, there's a lot to say about Vega Lite's grammar of graphics, but for today's talk, I really wanted to spend time unpacking its grammar of interaction. So what interaction techniques might be useful in the context of this scatter plot? Well, there's a lot of data here, and so a reasonable first place that I might start is by thinking about just adding some tooltips. And because tooltips are such a common interaction technique, we chose to do so via uh, just another encoding channel. And so here, for example, I populate the tooltips with the country and field, uh, year fields. And as I can see, there are a variety of countries present. And for each country, it seems like I have data from about 1955 to the year 2000. But how would I specify some more custom kinds of interactivity? For instance, I might be interested at interactively examining an individual country's trajectory in the broader context. To do so, rather than dealing with low-level programming to capture mouse clicks and then managing my state manually, I'm going to ask Vega Lite to do all that on my behalf. And the way I do that is with a new building block called a selection. So here's what the definition of a selection looks like. We're simply saying select a single country at a time, and by default, Vega infers that we mean on click, 
And so we can use this selection to drive a conditional opacity encoding to fade out unselected points. And so with just these two lines of code, I'm now more e easily able to pick out countries of interest and look at their trajectory uh, while keeping the rest of the points sort of still in that background there. By default, as I mentioned, all of this is happening on click and I can go into the spec and override it to say drive it by mouse hovers. Um, but I can also change the selection type from single to multi to be able to select multiple countries at a time. And I can even toggle them using a sort of click, shift, click type interaction, right? So I click the first country, shift, click selects additional countries. And then if I click the same country again, I, I sort of toggle them out. Now, besides looking at these individual countries, the other way I might choose to slice and dice my data is by the year. And so to do that, I can just add another selection to my specification, this time selecting a single year at a time. Um, but instead of just doing it via this sort of clicking type interaction, I might choose to instead bind it to dynamic query widgets, in this case, a range slider. And using the selection, I can now transform my data by filtering out points in the selection rather than doing any kind of conditional encoding. And so now again, with just a few lines of code, I have a slider that I can use to scrub forwards in time and see how all these countries are sort of making gains in the life expectancy, except when I scrub back and forth and I notice that real dip uh, by that one yellow dot. And when I hover over it and the tooltip appears, I identify that that country is, you know, Rwanda. Um, and, and that sort of precipitous drop in life expectancy is, is probably a result of the, the genocide that country experienced in the 1990s. Now, in terms of interaction design, it's a real shame that I no longer have my original country-based selection, but I could choose to bring that back by just layering these two interaction techniques together. So I can bring back that original specification with the opacity encoding. Um, and now what I'm able to do in this sort of really step-by-step -step way is cross-examine a country's trajectory against the progress that the rest of the world is making. For instance, here I can see that, you know, China in 1995, um, you know, it took China until 1995 to get to sort of where Japan and Italy were um, in 1955. And then if I start scrubbing the slider, I notice that sadly, even in the year 2000, Rwanda and Nigeria um, are sort of still stuck where China and India were in like 1955 or 1960. So, so far, I've only been showing these sort of discrete type interactions, right? Selecting a country at a time, a year at a time. And of course, we support more continuous types of interaction. And the way we do that is with these things called interval selections. So I can use this interval selection to drive a conditional color encoding. Um, and behind the scenes, Vega is automatically adding a brush mark to our visualization and doing all the event processing to be able to not only drag to brush, but also drag the brush around and zoom in and out. And of course, all my previous interactivity is still there. So I can scrub my slider, select multiple countries, so on and so forth. And finally, just as we could bind our single selection, we can also bind interval selections. In this case, we bind them to a visualization scales to enable panning and zooming. So using these selections, we're able to construct a pretty diverse range of interactive visualizations. And I thought I'd take just a minute to highlight some of my favorite examples from the Vega Light example gallery. So we can start, for example, again, just with panning and zooming, but this time in a scatter plot matrix where all these constituent views stay coordinated. Um, but in, in addition to panning and zooming, I can also brush in my scatter plot matrix and set the brushes to basically union together to drive my conditional color encoding. Or I can brush to interactively re-aggregate points in a histogram. In this case, the red line depicts the average value of the brush bars. Or I can brush to interactively re-bin my data in the sort of overview plus detail display. Right, so I brush out a region of interest in the top histogram and see those brushed points at a higher resolution, finer grained granularity um, in the bottom histogram. I can also use a single selection to interactively renormalize my data. Here I'm showing the percentage gained or lost for stock prices um, based on the, the date selected by my mouse, mouse pointer on hover. And finally, I can brush to interactively cross filter data across these three histograms. So here the blue bars are sort of filling in the gray regions to indicate the portion of data that lies within all the brushes, um, again, sort of just using interval selections and composing them together.
So at this point, I'm sort of reminded by Bertin's quote about the value of interactivity, and Vagalite's abstractions give us a nice way of specifying you know, this diverse range of visualizations, but I'm not yet sure we've done all we can to make sure that the best graphic operations are carried out by the decision maker themselves. Right? In particular, I don't think it's enough to simply build the tooling, but we need to figure out how it integrates with how data scientists work. And so recently, uh, one direction my collaborators and I have been investigating is how interactive visualizations are used, or rather are not, in computational notebooks like Jupyter. And in particular, we've been able to identify three gaps that currently limit how useful interact interactive visualizations are in this type of environment. The first is a layout gap, or the fact that visualizations get interleaved with code and commentary like we're seeing in the screenshot. And what this means is it sort of displaces one visualization from another, which means that if I interact in, in a visualization up here, I often have to scroll a whole bunch to see its effect on another visualization. And that really introduces a lot of friction um, to, to the interactive process. The second is what we might call a semantic gap. And this refers to the fact that visualizations currently need to be manually specified every single time with interactivity requiring an additional amount of effort, even though we would probably be able to infer the right set of techniques by tracing the, the data lineage expressed through transformations like the group by and the aggregates that we're seeing performed on the data frame right here. And worse, if I've gone through all the trouble of creating an interactive visualization, I'm frustrated to find that the results are actually just siloed in, they're locked into the interactive visualization, and I'm not able to extract them in any way for further analysis in my code. And finally, we identified something we call the temporal gap, where cell execution is persistent, but interactive results are transient. Now, persistence is good for all the benefits of literate computing, things like sharing my results and reproducibility and so forth, but it comes with its own baggage, particularly in the sort of accumulation of mess that a lot of data scientists report in these sort of notebooks. And on the other hand, transients violates these aspects of literate computing, right? It's really difficult for me to reproduce or share interactive results. Um, I basically need to manually document them, um, and, and that rarely happens in practice. Um, but the transients also sort of reduces the friction for engaging in any kind of iteration because it shifts iteration to just be a process of browsing through my results, uh, maybe even experiencing points serendipitously, rather than intentionally and explicitly authoring and executing code. And so to address these gaps, I've been collaborating with Ifan Wu and Joe Hellerstein of Berkeley, folks whom I'm sure the Hilda crowd are very familiar with, um, around the system called B2. And really B2 is work that Ifan has been um, leading. And so let's take a quick look at how B2 works. So we can start by invoking the B2 environment, which adds a dashboard is our, uh, on the side here. And this is our main way of addressing that layout gap, right? We're merging the linear notebook layout on the left with the dashboard styles of interfaces that have been so widely adopted for exploratory visual analysis. I start by importing a data frame um, and the data frames columns automatically populate in the dashboard, kind of uh, mimicking you know, a Tableau style of interface. And so this data set that we're working with um, is a data set of about 2 million wildfires in the United States. And a good way to start my EDA process is by getting a high level overview or sense of my data. And so I might go in and start by viewing the distribution of years and you know, I automatically get a table, but I might wanna see that as a histogram instead. And so B2 automatically instruments data frames with this viz function, um, and a Vega Lite visualization is automatically added to the dashboard. But notice how I didn't need to do any manual specification at all. Instead, B2 has inferred the correct visual encodings to use based on how the data frame was transformed. In particular, the group by operator that I used here um, produces a histogram. Now, we can also automatically create visualizations by, create, uh, by clicking the columns and overriding the specification um, in the code. For example, setting alternate sortings like I did there. And besides just synthesizing these visual encodings, we bridge the semantic gap in a second way. All of these histograms, are, even though they're derived as separate data frames, because they all share the same parent, B2 is automatically able to add uh, a cross-filtering interaction technique to these histograms. So for instance, I can click to select a state and shift click to select multiple states and all the other histograms update to depict these selections. Now, typically these interactions would all be transient, 
But to bridge that temporal gap, B2 logs an interaction history to the code cell shown here. As these are Vega light visualizations using selections, this interaction history is semantically meaningful to me. So rather than a log of sort of low level events, click streams and things like that, these are much more higher level selections um, about the, the states that I've selected and so forth. And I can go in and sort of comment and uncomment these log entries out as a way of rerunning and reproducing my interactive analysis. Now, besides discrete selections, click, shift, click, we of course support brushing, um, but B2 here tries to maintain that linear, uh, you know, narrative order of the notebook. And so it tries to distinguish multiple interactive sessions um, from one another. And so as a result, generates a new code cell for my brushes history. Besides these more abstract selection definitions, I can also extract my interactive results as a data frame for some sort of subsequent analysis. So here, for example, I'm just visualizing it as a table, but I might notice that my data frame actually has lat long coordinates um, defined. And so maybe I want to visualize my interactive results as a geospatial heat map using the leaflet library, and that's what I've done here. But one thing you might notice is the heat map is currently hard coded to the specific interactive results I initially copied out. Right? As I do additional interactions on the dashboard, the heat map doesn't update at all. And that might, again, just throw a little bit of friction into my interactive analysis process. And so instead, what I can do is replace that hard-coded set of selections with instead a dynamic call to get the filtered data and then use B2 to mark the cell as reactive. What happens is behind the scenes, B2 now ensures that every time an interaction occurs on those visualizations in the dashboard, any cells that are marked as reactive automatically get re-executed as well. And I no longer have any kind of messy history with doing this sort of like highly iterative and interactive analysis. So we're really excited about how B2 is helping bridge these two worlds of sort of literate computing on the left-hand side and exploratory visual analysis on the right-hand side. And we hope to release it soon as an open source project, um, hopefully in the next few months. But really this is only the first step. For instance, B2 can only automatically synthesize these cross-filtering interactions, despite the much more diverse range of interactive visualizations um, I was showing earlier in Vega Light. And so in a parallel research thread, my group has been exploring how to automatically synthesize a broader range of techniques by exploiting a property of Vega Light's grammar of interaction. And in particular, this grammar of interaction allows us to start with a single static scatter plot and then make a series of atomic edits, basically just changing one line of code or sometimes even just a single property. In each case, each of these edits yields a distinct interactive visualization, and the paths here are just some in a much larger design space that we can sort of systematically enumerate and reason about. And so in this parallel research thread, my students and I have been exploring how we might use this property, the fact that we can systematically enumerate the design space, to enable interactive visualization by demonstration in a system that we call Lyra. So here is Lyra's interface, um, and I'll just walk you through it at a high level. We've got a data table up at the top, and what we've done is just kind of broken the columns apart to, to create a, a tighter visual footprint. Along the left-hand side, we're listing all the elements that are part of our visualization, as well as providing visual property inspectors to manipulate their properties. And then front and center is the visualization canvas. And so this is where most of my operations um, designing my visualization will be occurring, along with a toolbar of common tools along the right-hand side. And so to create a scatter plot, I'd start by adding a symbol mark to my canvas, and to bind data fields to its properties, I start by dragging a data field from the data table. And when I do this, you'll notice that the canvas lights up with these cyan colored regions. Um, and we call these regions drop zones. And when I uh, get close to one, um, it's automatically selected. Um, in this case, the X drop zone. Um, and when I drop my field over them, Lyra automatically instantiates the necessary scales, axes, and legends I would need to produce a sort of recognizable visualization. What's actually happening is behind the scenes, Lyra is interpreting these drags and drops to produce the right Vega Light specification. Now, to add an interaction technique, I follow a similar process. I start by clicking to record an interaction technique and then dragging out a region on the canvas. 
Again, behind the scenes, Lyra is using Vegalite's grammar of interaction to enumerate all the possible candidates for what this dragging interaction might mean. And then it prunes that space of suggestions and exposes them as these thumbnail previews that you're seeing on the left-hand side. Clicking a thumbnail allows me to sort of preview its effect. For example, I can look at these sort of unidimensional brushes, but the visualization canvas stays live. By what I mean is I can actually test out my interaction technique without entering some kind of debugging mode. It's all happening right there, right? So I can see what the effect of adding all these three kinds of um, you know, conditional encodings for color, opacity, and size, uh, or I could see what the effect of panning and zooming the visualization might be. You know, in all of these cases, I could have expressed them in Vega Light, but I would have had to do a lot of sort of textual specification, and Lyra has transformed that process to be much more about direct manipulation and demonstration rather than um, textual specification. So I'm able to maybe be more quick um, in my prototyping and my exploration of the design space. Let's just take one final example um, to see how we can use Lyra to design a little more custom interactivity. Say I have um, stock price data, but rather than interactively renormalizing it, like in our earlier example, I want to interactively label points along the line with their prices on a given day. Right? So I add a rectangle mark for that sort of vertical rule. And then I demonstrate an interaction to say, every time I'm hovering, pick out the nearest date along the x-axis. And then I use that selection to basically position that vertical rule. I now add through a series of interactions, uh, symbol marks and text marks to label each of the individual points. Um, but as you can tell, it's a very crowded display. And so I flip back to my interaction definition and use it to conditionally set the opacity of my text labels. And I notice a little bit of weird sort of flashing occurring, so I make sure that I'm always selecting the nearest point to my mouse cursor. And finally, I set the size of my symbols um, based on that, that selection as well. And so here I have my final interactive technique working. Again, I didn't need to write any lines of code, but instead Lyra was inferring the necessary Vega Light specifications based entirely on my manipulations of, a, of its graphical interface and the direct manipulation demonstrations that I was doing on the canvas. So we're also very excited about Lyra and expect to polish it up for release in about um, the next few months. Um, and so along with, with B2, we now have sort of two initial points in this design space of how to enable richer support for interactivity in these higher level systems for visual analysis um, and design. And I think the two of these systems suggest some really exciting future research directions. Right? So how do we go towards effective interaction with data visualization? And the first might be how we might better determine sort of the equivalent of Jock McKinley's effectiveness criteria, but for interaction techniques. On the visual encoding side, you know, starting with Cleveland and McGill's seminal studies, we've now had sort of over three decades of research into graphical perception that have helped us develop these types of rankings on how effective various visual variables are um, at encoding different types of information. However, we lack anything analogous for interaction techniques, and I suspect part of the problem has been the, the representations we've had to work with, right? These really low-level event handling callbacks that have made it difficult maybe to figure out how to design, um, you know, experimentally design equivalent sets of studies. And so here an interaction grammar might really help, right? We can enumerate all the alternate techniques for a given analytic task um, and then test them with human subjects, both at scale via crowdsourcing and then in sort of situated contexts. But a key challenge here is the time taken and accuracy, which have been the sort of traditional metrics for graphical perception studies, don't seem to be as meaningful for interactivity. So how might we instead measure and quantify and compare interaction techniques in terms of the insights they surface for analysts and readers and the impact on, on our cognition. Next, and continuing to an analogize to visual encodings, the effectiveness rankings for visual encodings have yielded this really rich space of visualization recommender systems, right? A lot of work particularly coming from this workshop uh, as well. Systems like Compass and CDB and, and um, Dive and things like that. What would the equivalent for interaction techniques be? We see some early examples in B2 and Lyra, but there, I think there's a, sort of a lot of work to be done here, right? So how might we synthesize appropriate interactive visualizations using the effectiveness rankings from the previous step? 
And besides just recommending interaction designs, could a recommender system also accelerate interactive analysis by suggesting unexplored paths? Now, a rich body of work already exists studying how to mine analytic provenance, but here again, prior representations of interaction, as these low-level events and properties, might have been holding us back. How much further are we able to go if we mine interaction histories that are instead recorded as these sem semantically meaningful selections like we do in B2? And here too, the key challenge, um, like we experienced in B2, is instantiating these ideas within the context of data science, um, existing data science workflows and environments and so forth. And so how might we automatically infer a user's intent from the rest of their interactions with their environment? And finally, um, is how might these higher level grammars of interaction suggest paths forward for supporting synchronous and asynchronous collaboration? For instance, my students and I have been exploring the design space of, te of techniques for establishing common ground and shared awareness uh, amongst users, including techniques like synchronized cursors, a legend of cursors, or even small thumbnail previews like we have in Lyra. And using these sort of techniques, one can sort of peek into or track another user's interaction um, while still maintaining your own sort of um, you know, separate isolated state. However, to more seriously consider collaborative interactive analysis, we need to move beyond the desktop and think not just about um, you know, mobile and tablet devices, but also things like large display walls and so forth. So what does a more embodied and situated style of interactive visualization look like, and how does that change our relationship to the data? So these are just some of the questions I'm really excited about in this design space. And I'd like to wrap up by sort of acknowledging all the fantastic members of my research group who along with sort of many collaborators over the years have really helped me define this research agenda and are helping me push it forward. So thank you very much.